Hello, Super Soul Seekers. Happy Sunday morning to y'all. My friend Gary Zukov and I have had so many fascinating conversations over the years, and you have seen him as a familiar face here on Super Soul Sunday because he has truly been one of my greatest teachers since 1989 when I first read this book and my life started to change. I'm so glad to be able to bring him back because his words still inspire and still teach me to this day Page 37 of this book, when a personality in full is in full balance, you cannot see where it ends and the soul begins. That is a whole human being. I believe that's what we're all striving for in the seat of the soul. Gary's words tend to resonate in a new way every time you hear them. And one of the most memorable and meaningful conversations that he and I had was about addiction. Wow, did I have a lot of shifts during that conversation. It wasn't until I read The Seed of the Soul in the chapter on addiction that I fully understood that addiction really is our holiest moment. It's an opportunity for us to spiritually grow forward. And this is so important. What we'll be talking about today isn't just addiction to alcohol or drugs, which everybody's familiar with, but I learned on that show that you can be addicted to anything to food, to shopping, to anger, to sex, to people pleasing, whatever it is that you use to fill the void and numb your own pain or numb your ability to move forward. Gary reminds us that all addictions, all of them are the same. So you can't stand in superiority over somebody who's a drug addict if you are a food addict or if you're a shopaholic or if you're a person who's a people pleaser. So get ready to dig deep and think about the role that addiction may be playing in your own life. Think about it in a whole new way. Today we're getting to the heart of what lies beneath addictions and compulsions with Gary Zukov. He's the author of The Seed of the Soul, one of my favorite books in the world, uh, and is fast becoming other people's favorite too. He says, when you discover an addiction, this is really big, uh, I have this underlined in the book, that you actually have something to feel joyful about. Why? Because, <laughs> this is important, there's nothing joyful about an addiction. An addiction is your greatest inadequacy. An addiction is the part of your personality that's out of control, that's not joyful. You're creating pain continually. But when you discover it, when you realize that this is what you are doing, then you can at last do something about it. Because if you don't see it and you don't recognize it, you cannot do anything about it. So recognizing that you have a problem, a part of yourself that's out of control, then you can go about the process of healing it. And that's where the joyful occasion comes. Because right until you there. recognize it, you tell yourself you love champagne. Until you yes, recognize it, you tell right. yourself it's just another great looking guy walk by. Yes. Or until you recognize it, you tell yourself, I just love potatoes. That's right. <laughs> so this is Kelly, who says that she thinks she's hit the lowest point in her life because she knows that she is completely out of control with food, often eating until it makes her sick. Take a look. Dear Oprah, I was sexually abused as a child and addictions have been my way of coping. As a little girl, I felt really hollow inside and food helped comfort me. As I got older, being overweight helped me feel safe. I figured no one would find an overweight woman attractive. Now. When I look at myself in the mirror, it makes me sick. Food was my friend and it used to make me feel better. But now I feel so hopeless, I eat out of disgust for myself. I realize that I am addicted and I am desperate to figure out how to begin to heal myself. Kelly wants to know how to break free from her addiction and how to begin to find joy in her life. So what do you want to say to her? You're finding it now, Kelly. This is it. Underneath that impulse to eat is a feeling of powerlessness. You are manipulating and controlling the external world by becoming obese and saying no one would want a fat woman. I'm safe. It's the same sense of powerlessness and vulnerability. One person can try to assuage that by becoming sexually manipulative. You are sexually manipulative too, but in the other direction. You are manipulating men and the world into thinking that you are not attractive and not desirable, and that's how you are attempting to feel safe. As far away as possible, that's yes, right. absolutely. That's right. Now, that's external power. That's reaching for and using external power. 
Do you all see? Yeah. The connection. And I want to suggest I that beneath every I see it for herself. I see it for herself. I don't see it for me. Because as you know, I've told you, I'm, I, I think I have some food issues. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and I think I think I'm an addict. I think I'm specifically a carbohydrate addict because I'm not addicted to fish and salad. <laughs> you know, I never feel I never I never feel like bring on the vegetables. <laughs> Can't get enough. I never feel like that. But bread and potatoes and, and macaroni and cheese and you know. Do you Anybody know? else in here identify with that? <laughs> I, feel, I feel comforted by it, but I can't, I, for the life of me, and I've read that chapter, you should see in my own book, and Seat of the Soul, how that addiction chapter is underlined, I've underlined and underlined things. For the life of me, I can't see how I'm seeking power with it. I feel pretty powerful in my life, I really do. And I know the difference between external power and authentic power. I know that which is real. I do not think that when I sit down to eat, you know, mashed potatoes, that it is about me seeking power. Can you help me? <laughs> no, really, seriously, I, I really don't. That depends on you. Okay. Would you mind sharing the story that you told me about the moment that you remember asking Art to fix you macaroni and cheese and bread pudding? And what led up to that? Would I mind sharing it? Yes. Um, it was the day after Beloved opened. Right. And the box office was not what any of us had expected. And I felt disappointed. I felt uh, uh, rejected. I felt, I felt powerless. I felt powerless. Bingo. I got it, I got it, I got it. No. I got it. No. Okay, <laughs> bingo, okay. There's more. There was more. Something else was happening in your life then that you told me about. What was it? Let the Oprah backlash begin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was going on at the same time. Oh. About the, the spirit segment. You know, people were talking about, we just started doing the spirit segment, and all of these stories were coming out about let the Oprah backlash begin at the same time that Beloved did not yes. do what we'd expected at the box office. And my way of, I just clicked. I clicked, bingo, bingo. Can you see the lights going on? Uh, I, at the same time that day, that all of that kind of all happened in the same day, newspaper articles and beloved rejection, I said to Art, make me some macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and, and bread, bread pudding. pudding. <laughs> now, the focus is... Let the eating begin. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to bring but to you... But I didn't connect to powerlessness to just this moment. Right. Okay. okay. That's it. And, and you touched me so deeply when you told me how hurtful it was. And you told Art one night, make me macaroni and cheese and make me bread pudding. I'm going to cry now. Mm. I did. I didn't realize that that's what it was, though. I thought I just wanted some macaroni. <laughs> that's and it. And I've been me eating macaroni ever since, but I thought I just wanted some macaroni. The craving is real and it's strong, whatever it is. In this case, it was for macaroni and cheese and bread pudding generalized to carbohydrates. That craving is real. That craving is powerful. And you can try to deal with it at that level. But what we are suggesting on this show is that you go deeper. Go deeper. Well, and what see else could I have else. done? What, what else? Oh, well, I could, have, I could have said, let me go run. I could have said, let me go to the gym. Oh, gee, <laughs> beloved didn't do what I thought. You it could have said, let me go shopping. You could have said, let me go gambling. Are you beginning to recognize how this works when the power? But I know I'm trying to think of a, a, a more powerful alternative I could have had. I could have said, but uh, right then I just thought I, I needed the macaroni. But you know what that, I'm saying? Yeah, I just. I know what you're saying. I believe that I do, and what I would suggest the alternative is, please let me feel. Mm -hmm. Let me feel. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Let me feel. Yeah. Ooh. Because here's another commonality. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh. yeah that oh, hurts. That, that hurts. Even yeah. now it hurts yeah. to feel that. Even now it hurts. Let me feel. There's another commonality. Under every addictive Jerry, behavior, may just, may there's something say, too painful. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Why would I want to sit there and feel all of that? Because if you don't, you will need to contend with this very strong impulse to eat, gamble, buy, run, drink, have sex. 
That's, That's not right. what I was feeling. Honey. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That yes. carbohydrates hydrates were the craving that Oprah felt in a moment of powerlessness and vulnerability. But it could have been many other things. I think that was a breakthrough that. moment we just had, Gary. Yeah. I think that was. And now I'll take a break and come back. We'll be right back. That was really good. Thank you. So Gary raised a few eyebrows when he said that the most common addiction in the world is sex addiction. Uh, this is a pretty provocative thought and can be a difficult one to wrap your head around. When I've tried to convince some of my girlfriends that their relationships were really with sex addicted men, they still don't see it. Gary says, anytime somebody uses sex to feel more powerful, more beautiful, more worthy, more lovable, deep down that person is really feeling powerless. Hmm, interesting. Gary Zukov, who's author of Seat of the Soul, is back. And Gary has a really unique perspective on this topic because he, too, has been an addict. Take a look. My addiction wasn't to alcohol and it wasn't to drugs. My addiction was to sex. I would look for people that I could seduce and they would be exciting to me. Gary's not alone. He says sexual addiction is the most common addiction in the human experience. His addiction controlled him from the time he was a student at Harvard through his years in the army up until his mid 40s. Everything was a scam, a scam for me to help me get sexual partners to help me feel better about myself. Studies estimate that there are 20 million sex addicts in the United States today. Doesn't that, isn't that a startling figure? Gary Zukov says he thinks that number is actually much higher. Why, Gary? I know it's much higher, Oprah. If sex for you is a way of satisfying an emotional craving, a hunger, of making you feel more worthy, more lovable, then I want to suggest that this is not loving energy. It's something else. Yes, and you, you describe it as walking into a room and almost like an antenna where you see who can be your prey. This is a full-blown sexual addiction. That's someone who's out of control will be looking for someone that he or she can seduce. But what I want to suggest that underneath that strong sexual craving or underneath that strong craving for food or underneath that strong craving for alcohol is something else. And I would like to keep looking at the something else. It is a craving to make yourself feel worthy and lovable. In that moment, you are feeling powerless. Okay. This is Catherine, a recovering sex addict, who says she never had normal relationships with men because she was always trying to seduce them. Now, everybody knows of somebody like this. We usually think of men this way. Um, she craved the chase, but like any kind of addict, never felt fulfilled. Take a look. Dear Oprah, I have been recovering from my sexual addiction for a little over a year. For most of my life, I have been searching for love and approval from men. I only felt like I was worthwhile and in control when I could seduce man after man. My search for love and self-esteem led to a short stint of prostitution and affairs in my marriage. As a massage therapist, I often crossed the ethical lines before and after massages. And the more I looked for fantasy, seduction, and love, the more pain I felt. I was morally and ethically wounded. I had to face the ache in my heart and soul and learn to love myself. When did you identify yourself as an, a sexual addict? Well, it was about two years ago, I guess. And because I'm a massage therapist, you know, that's been very much a trigger for me. Like a professional one? A professional massage therapist. Mm -hmm. So it's been a trigger for me uh, to have, and believe me, I attract all the sex addicts onto my table. They come to me because I, you know, my sexual energy would just leak out. I, I would be right there, you know, having a temptation, having a desire, and that energy would just be coming out. And I feel- And the person on the table would feel that? They can feel that. Yeah. They can feel that energy. We're so close there. The energy is so close. So I could do the massage, but sometimes the boundaries got crossed, either before or after the massage. But I always held the line right there on the massage. You know, it was like, I'm doing the massage, but the ethical boundaries were crossed before 
or after. Wow. I knew I was out of control a couple of years ago, probably maybe three, and I started looking into reading some books by Patrick Carnes, Don't Call It Love, and I didn't get hooked up with a 12-step a group, though, for another year after that. Mm -hmm. I wanted power. I wanted love. I thought, I am my body. This isn't a conscious thought that you had. I'm looking for power. No, not conscious, but, you know, it's that... I'm looking to be loved? I'm looking to be loved. So it's are that, love and power the mm -hmm. same thing by your de definition? Is that what you're saying? You're looking for a way to feel worthy. Yes. Yes, there's a... If you really experience your life, you'll find that there's a terror of being alive. It's very difficult to be in this world. To say that the human species is insecure is to state the obvious. So the question is, how do we deal with that inner insecurity? Do we reach outward to try to manipulate and control the things that are around us to make us feel more secure gotcha. and more whole? Now I do get that. Y'all get that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, I really wanted to be seen. I had a deep, deep longing to be seen for who I really yes. was. And I was terrified of that. Terrified. And that's the addiction covered over that longing. And it's really a longing for me, a longing for God, a longing for that connection, that spiritual connection. All right, I get that. We'll be right back. Now we're thinking about this idea of addiction a little differently, right? It's not just drugs and alcohol that people might be addicted to. It's about whatever you or anyone uses to feel more powerful when they're overwhelmed by feelings of powerlessness. It's why some people go straight to the fridge when they're feeling anxious or depressed. I've done that, caught myself in the middle of a bag of chips saying, what am I doing? It's why someone else goes and buys another pair of shoes they don't need. It might be why somebody can't manage to leave a bad relationship. Spiritual growth is really all about getting to the heart of your own matter. We're talking to Gary Zukov, who says that recognizing an addiction is the first step in the healing process. And I know so many of you uh, who have emailed us got that. We call them the bing moments that click for you. And a lot of you said, okay, now I got it. So now what next? What happens after that can be especially frightening. This is Lisa. And she believes that her addiction to shopping uh, is just as devastating as a, an addiction to narcotics. Uh, or to other substances. She has lied to her family. She has gone bankrupt and almost lost her home as a result of her addiction to shopping. Take a look. When I shop, it's difficult to describe the sense of fulfillment and being loved that I feel. When I was married, I'd sneak things in when my husband wasn't home and um, cut the tags off real quick and get the bags in the trash and you do whatever you can to hide it because you don't want people to know about it. Five and a half years ago, I filed for bankruptcy. I probably had $25,000 in credit card debt, and it had totally consumed my life. A lot of the, the things that I bought certainly center around myself and my person and, and making me look good and feel good. It wasn't until about two years ago, and that was when I, it looked like I was close to losing my house, that. I realized that something was seriously wrong and that I needed to find, figure out a way to do something about it. I'm ashamed of it. And, and I don't think that people understand how consuming it is like any other addiction. It, it makes me think that it's not something that, that society acknowledges is a problem. But it is and it's devastating. Well, thank you so much for sharing that because I have done shows, you know, over the years with lots of women who kind of joke about it, about mm -hmm. hiding things from their husband, leaving things in the trunk, you know, mm -hmm. having their closets filled, who I'm sure are having a bing bing moment uh, <laughs> watching you right now. And Lisa says she doesn't know how, Gary, to start healing. First of all, an addiction is your path to your spiritual growth. It's your greatest inadequacy. So the first step in healing an addiction, after you have recognized that you have one, that a part of your life is out of control, is to let yourself go in to that addiction. 
Let yourself feel how powerful the attraction that it has for you is inside of you. Let yourself feel how deeply rooted it is in you and how strong it is. And know that it is real. And part of realizing how real that addiction is, is to walk yourself through your reality when you have an addictive temptation. For example, uh, ask yourself, if I do what I'm thinking about doing, uh, what will it create in my life? What will it do to my relationship? What will it do for my children? Will it uh, cause a pain to those around me? But don't you feel, Lisa, too, that you've done that, that you've said, I, you've walked yourself through it, the consequences in your mind, and something says, I don't know, erases all of that. You walk yourself through it, and then you say, but this time it won't be that way. Or you walk yourself through it and say, in this moment, in this moment, I really want to go to Walmart. In this moment, I really want those shoes. You see what I'm saying, Gary? Yes, that attraction is real. It is powerful, and it is controlling you. You are out of control. And realizing that is the first step in healing an addiction, understanding it deeply. Not that you are judged, not that you will be a better or a lesser person, simply that you will continue to create painful circumstances if you allow yourself to remain out of control. <coughs> and you will create healthy and empowering circumstances if you start to move in an empowering and a healthy way. Well, I like you. I thought I had another moment here. I don't know if you all did. I think when you refer to it as your greatest inadequacy, yeah. does this connect to you too, yeah. Lisa? Your greatest inadequacy, because I think a lot of people are hung up on the word addiction. Yes. But mm -hmm. if you describe it as your greatest inadequacy, because that, you know, that's how I feel about my relationship with food. How can I be so powerful in all these other areas yes. of my life and then be conquered by a potato chip? You know, that's what I think exactly. sometimes. How can I be, how could a bag of ruffles hold that much power over me? But that is my greatest inadequacy. You've said it precisely. And I want to clarify, it is not the potato chip that holds power over you. What is it? What really has power over you is an inner emptiness that needs to be filled. In and that moment. In that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in that moment that you feel that inner emptiness or powerlessness. And you feel it, how? In the form of a longing for some potatoes, a longing for some more shoes, right. a longing for another sexual partner. That's why I'm saying do not think that at that level, the level of willpower, you can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. What you need to know is where to apply your will. It's not simply not having another potato chip today or not having another candy bar or not buying another pair of shoes. It is going for the root of the problem and pulling it at the root. Okay. The root is the pursuit of external power rather than going inward to fill the hole. We'll be right back. One of the key themes of Seat of the Soul is what Gary Zukov calls responsible choice. Woo, boy, did I love that chapter. It's remembering that in every single moment, you have a choice. In a moment of stress, in a moment of weakness, in a moment when you're exhausted, you still have the ability to choose to challenge the temptation to do whatever, to drink, or the temptation to eat, or the temptation to lash out in anger. And every time, he says, every single time we challenge our temptations, we become more powerful. Try it. I mean, for just the simplest thing. Every time you put down that bag of chips, or you put down that bottle, or you put down whatever it is that is your addiction that means that you become more aligned with your soul this is shelly she's been struggling with her addiction for 16 years she says alcohol is one of the few things that brings her pleasure but she also knows that it is ruining her life take a look at shelly dear oprah i am married with three stepchildren i have struggled for the last 16 years with alcoholism while keeping a full-time job. I've stopped drinking twice, but I continue to relapse. I just can't seem to succeed in a recovery program. I feel about 10 years older than my 37 years due to the stress of my alcohol addiction. 
I don't drink every day, but when I do drink, at its worst, it can be up to 18 beers or until I pass out. It's a very insane and awful way of life. I just can't seem to quit. Shelley wants to know why she keeps relapsing. The central point in healing an addiction is realizing that the difference between the life that you're living and the life that you want to live is a matter of responsible choices. That you are capable of making choices from which you can draw power rather than making choices that drain power from you. I can go for a period of time, you know, five days or even two, three months, but it's like it just keeps pulling me back. You know, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable if, if I'm stressed out um, by just going home and... I mean, I have to have that drink to relax or you do not to be have, happy. You do not have to have the drink. You want to have the, I drink. Want to have the drink. And that wanting is very powerful. Mm -hmm. What stands between you and a fuller life is a matter of responsible choice. And there is no one else who can make the choice. It is really as simple as that. <coughs> it may be that your drinking is the only source of pleasure really in your life. If so. It's my only source of release. It's the only way I know how to release, you know, or relax. It may be that this comfort that you get from mm -hmm. drinking is the most uh, meaningful comfort to you or the most uh, satisfying comfort. And you will have to ask, or am I ready to give that up? Right. I want to give it up. I mean, I want well, to. Let's look at that, because if you really wanted it, then I ask you, why are you still drinking? This is an important question, and it's not, and it's not to make you feel Right, less. I understand. Um, what I want to suggest, Kelly, is this before you answer, that if your addiction lingers, it is because at heart you do not wish to release it. You stand between your lesser life and your fuller life your unconscious life and your conscious life. You stand between the world of being controlled by external circumstances or the world of being wholesome and whole, inwardly secure. What choose you? Can't do this. You're doing really fine. No, I'm not. But that's really hard. Yes, you are. You're doing really fine. That's a hard, hard question. He doesn't want you to say anything right now. Okay. Isn't that true, Gary? She's that saying is true. she doesn't understand what you want her to say. That's the question. I mean, that's the question. Do you all get this? Uh, it is, um, I guess it's the fundamental question we all ask ourselves every day. You all, are you all tracking? As Gary says, are you tracking with us? Yeah. See, I understand her confusion, though. I really do. And I know a lot of you are with us, too. You understand the confusion. Because everybody who has ever had a craving, uh, you know, experienced your deepest inadequacy in whatever form, right. there is not a one of us. I mean, this whole country has a multi-billion dollar industry. I can just speak of what I know. The dieting, the dieting industry. There's a whole industry re re that has evolved and revolves around people who say tomorrow or Monday. And everybody who's going on a diet this Monday wants it. Everybody who says, all right, this is my last, you know, bottle of beer. Everybody, I think, is just like Kelly. You say, I want it. So what she's having trouble understanding is, I, is that I do want it. I think I have chosen that I want it. Oh, I know that. Yeah. I yeah. Know that I and want you're it. saying that you have to go deeper than wanting right. it. You have to understand that the attraction is not to beer. That doesn't mean that you don't strongly want to have it. What do you then ask yourself in that moment, in that very moment where you want the whatever, you want the alcohol, the food, the shopping, the, to overwork yourself, what do you do? Challenge it. Challenge, challenge it. it. Hmm. That's right. Every time you challenge your anger, your anxiety, your jealousy, you begin to gain power over it, and it gains power over you. But until you feel it, you cannot know what it is in order to challenge it. And as you set the intention to challenge your anger or your judgment or your pain, all of these things that 
lie beneath addictive behavior, mm -hmm. then you begin to gain power over those parts of yourself as you challenge them again and again. But expect the challenge, expect the opposite to show up because the moment you say, I'm going to now not be out of control shopping is when your friend calls and say, you know what, let's go shopping. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. This is the <laughs> challenge in your life. It comes out in the seemingly irresistible attraction to alcohol, drugs, sex, food, shopping, gambling. You cannot make it easy. This is what you were born to heal. You cannot grow spiritually. You cannot develop genuine power without making choices that do not stretch you. And the purpose of temptation is what, though, Gary? A temptation allows you to recognize, address, and heal a part of yourself that is unhealthy before you create negative consequences for yourself. So a temptation could be a good thing. A temptation is a good thing. A temptation is a gracious gift from the universe that shows you a way that you are going to create negative consequences for yourself if you live it out. What is beneath oh, that key, temptation key, key. is pain, is pain. And when you feel that pain, that is what you can challenge. Gotcha. I just love it when Gary allows us to see what a gift temptation can be. You know, I never thought of it that way until I had this conversation with him. Even when I read it, I didn't get it, get it. But isn't that a paradigm shifter? Temptation is really your opportunity for a holy moment. It's a signal from the universe, a reminder that, hmm, in that moment where you're most tempted, this is the moment you get to choose. Do you want painful consequences? Or do you want to become more whole and more powerful? Every time you challenge a temptation, you get to grow spiritually. I love that. A temptation is an opportunity that is graciously given to you by the universe to have a dry run Correct. at a life situation, which if you can see clearly, you can remove or heal before you can affect the lives of others. This is the blessing. If you look at what your temptations are showing you, you will have the opportunity to change within yourself parts of yourself that are on the brink of performing actions that will create painful consequences for others and yourself. Do you see how merciful and compassionate this is? Okay, you say in Seat of the Soul, page 143, temptation is the universe's compassionate way of allowing you to run through what would be a harmful negative karmic dynamic, karmic meaning everything you put out is going to come back, if you were to allow it to become physically manifested. It's the energy through which your soul is given the gracious opportunity to have a dry run at a life lesson. I like that. You get the dry run. Now, then if you go and do it, you get the wet run. That's right. right. You get the wet run and you get drowned sometimes. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay, so this is the dry run at what could happen, right? Right. Because once you do it, you then affect yourself and usually other people are also affected. Not usually. Always. Always. Okay. When you make a choice in your life, you choose one of numerous possible futures and you bring that future into your life that into consequence. your reality. See, I love what you said one time on the show. You said, you think of choice as a door, th that a door, and that every time you make a choice, there is always going to be behind that door a consequence. Every choice has with it a consequence. Yes. Every decision that you make has is, a is an effect, is a cause that has an effect. an effect. And you have, whenever you have choices, several doorways through which you can walk. Right. Whenever you walk through one of those doorways, you bring a particular possible future into your reality. It becomes your present. And you see, again before you, more doorways, more choices. This is how you create your life. Right. When you are considering, or parts of you are considering doing something that will create painful consequences in your life. Which is a temptation. Temptation is the dynamic that allows you to see what you are about to do. When you are driving, for example, into the desert, 
Yes. And you know that you have a long road ahead of you for days mm -hmm. on a barren desert without anyone out there. There is always a gas station just before you enter the desert. And right. you know what that sign always says on the gas station? Last chance. This is your last chance to look inside yourself oh, good. and heal what is within you. So that's what a temptation you... is. That's what a temptation is. Fabulous. You did that very well. OK. It's it, the dress rehearsal. Precisely. But you don't have to go on the stage. That's right. I got that. That's right. <laughs> that's okay. right. This is on uh, page 160 of The Seat of the Soul, if you look reading from the paperback. When you struggle with an addiction, you deal directly with the healing of your soul. It's the work of evolution. It's the work that you were born to do. Every time you challenge a temptation, you gain power, and the thing that you're tempted to or against loses power. That's right. Yeah. OK. This is Vicky. She says that her out of control shopping and spending was taking over her life until she read just one paragraph in Gary's book. Right, exactly. What was the passage? I know you said the paragraph. I'm like, what was it? <laughs> it's on page 155, mm -hmm. um, and I'd have to paraphrase it, but it was to ask yourself the following questions when you're feeling your addiction, call okay. in your name. And um, we have those questions, I think. This is a tool that helped Vicky. The first question you can ask is, does this bring me genuine power? That's a good question. In other words, do you feel empowered when you drink and you know you don't really want to? Or you feel you really want to, but there's something deep inside of you that says, don't do this. Do you Drink really... or argue or whatever yours. Fill exactly. in your blank. The next question Ask. is, will this make me more loving? Will, Buying a pair of shoes? Will it really make you more loving to smoke a cigarette? It's tempting to think, yes, it will. I was a heavy smoker at one time. I was in the Army. I did drink a lot, and I thought it would make me more loving. But as I really looked at How those... How did you think smoking was going to make you more loving? <laughs> no, really, seriously. No, I, I smoked the kind of cigarettes that made me feel like a cowboy, just about to rope a cow. <laughs> and that was my image. I thought that people loved guys like that. <laughs> and so I tried to be a guy like that, and I smoked the cigarettes that I was told they smoked. That's how it works. I see what you're saying. The smoking was sort of tied into the whole, I'm a macho kind of man. Exactly. And, and I thought and macho kind of man, men who were real men, men who meant what they say, men who got the job done, men who didn't cry, and on and on. You know the list, especially, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you know the list. That, I thought, was making me more lovable. But it wasn't. And so one of the questions you can ask yourself when you're about to drink, have sex with someone that you don't really know, mm -hmm. buy some shoes that you don't need, gamble, uh, get enraged. Ask yourself, will this make me lovable? And Truly. will this make me more whole? And will this make me more whole? Will I be more complete if I buy a new car? The entire advertising industry is oriented toward assuring you that it will. The message is, as you gain external power, the ability to manipulate and control others through buying this car, through buying these shoes, through smoking cigarettes, you will become more whole, more lovable, more powerful. But the opposite is true. You lose power each time you do something that you do not need to do in order to make yourself feel more lovable. To be loving, you must give to others, not attempt to take from others, not attempt to draw love from them, as you would draw fish in out of a stream. Temptation is the dynamic that will show you those parts of yourself that are reaching outward to make you feel more valuable at the expense of someone else. Got it. Before you actually have to live through the experience. So the moment where you're reaching out and that moment where you're the most tempted, that's the moment you need to stop yourself and look inward. You, yes. You don't need to because if you don't stop yourself, you will simply act what it is you are seeing in this theater in your mind. Gotcha. And when you do that, you create the painful consequences for you and the painful consequences for others. But if you look at the dress rehearsal, yeah, full color, yeah, full cast. You right there. Right there. 
and you walk yourself through your reality and you say, what would happen to me, really, if I did that? Uh huh. And then you decide not to, you have confronted a part of yourself that would have used another person before you used that other person, before you created consequences in another person's life. That is the power of temptation. Well, Super Solars, I hope you found some wisdom and some inspiration in Gary's words today. We're going to see you back here next week for some more food for your soul right here on Super Soul Sunday. Keep those comments coming. I just love them. Thank you. <laughs>